Burger, you can start. Yeah. Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Just as They Teach, an academic initiative by the School of Law at Sastra University. We have with us in the second part of the lecture series, Justice K. Kannan, former judge, High Court of Punjab and Haryana, and former chairperson of the National Railway Claims Tribunal. I think all of us would remember the first part of Justice Kannan's lecture, which happened in September on where law meets medicine. And we must surely recall the wide range of subjects which are covered under this broad umbrella. And uh, he had also indicated that he would continue to touch upon some specific areas which uh, require attention. And uh, I'm sure that this week's lecture will be interesting as well. And for those who are joining us new, uh, Justice Kandan has also written an extremely well-received book on law and medicine, which is part of the prescribed reading at the School of Law, Sastra University. And has also edited a number of books on various subjects like insurance, uh, medical jurisprudence, civil law. And we see Justice Kannan as a confluence of the best of practical knowledge and academic wisdom. So may I hand over the mic to Justice Kannan for his lecture today. Good morning to all of you. And uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be back with you. I must have done this even uh, perhaps last month. I had missed out the date and I was uh, with some other commitment and therefore requested for an adjournment. Uh, I normally am very difficult in my court to take adjournments, but then happily I was not uh, the person who was deciding the issue of when it should be adjourned. Thank uh, thankfully, the university was prepared to accommodate my request. Uh, this again is uh, no big deal uh, that if it was not the last month uh, arriving it uh, this month, you wouldn't mind because it's, it's merely trying to acquire knowledge. It can come at any time. So um, the previous time when I spoke to you, I spoke to you about um, issues of medical education, the importance of what this need and uh, uh, what, the, what do we understand, the, the reservation of things of what happens. I was telling you also about uh, the informed consent and what the new changes in law have been and how um, UK looks at a different principle than Bolam and how Indian courts are also trying to uh, secure that new uh, things. And, and I was also uh, telling you about uh, the Public Health Act and the, the pandemic situation of what has come about, the new um, concerns uh, of uh, arresting this uh, pandemic and how do we secure that by law. And some magic remedies of what some people are uh, promising and what is the uh, legal provision there which can be attracted to this. And also um, told you, probably concluded with uh, the important change that came through the judgment of the Supreme Court in Navte Singh's Johar uh, 377, uh, decriminalizing homosexuality. Um, now, and I promised that I will take new things. And uh, today I thought I'll pick up from where uh, it started uh, last time um, and ended uh, about the consent. Whenever we talked about consent, I was giving you about uh, National uh, Commission judgment, which had an uh, unusual take uh, on uh, an issue of uh, uh, getting the informed consent in cyclostyled or typewritten form and merely filling, filling in details. And uh, when talking about consent, I was uh, referring also to uh, the booming litigation that was happening against doctors. Uh, do you know now it is not merely the patient's uh, claim against doctors, the cases against doctors and hospitals that is uh, gaining currency, but there is a uh, the flip side is also the doctors are worried about the kind of litigations which are happening. 
and uh, the doctor patient relationship must improve that things are bad if something goes wrong that the hospitals uh, come under severe uh, strain they pelt stones they stop the cars of doctors uh, garo doctors do all kind of things to an extent that the medical council of india had uh, reported to the government that things are not happening all right even in situations where we treat the covid patients and somebody dies we all know that there is no cure which is found for covid it's just that it is not fatal at all times it's only about 1% here perhaps in india and 3% uh, everywhere, everywhere everywhere else that they turn out to be fatal uh, by and large people survive Uh, it's like a cold, and somebody will survive. Uh, some persons will not. Mm, unlike cold, it's not necessary that you have must touch. It can transmit by air, and therefore, even the trains, if it picks up above, if the uh, wind the velocity is more than 90 km, they stop the trains. Is the instruction which the court has given. Now, um, therefore, this uh, the government they um, talked, they petitioned to the government and said that. we need to have better relations something is not all right who was also concerned about it you know they had arranged for a conference in 2011 as early as that and uh, they said we must uh, discuss the experiences in strengthening the doctor patient relationship we must uh, identify measures uh, to strengthen the doctor patient relationship and to review a draft strategy we need a new straight uh, uh, strategic framework for strengthening the doctor uh, relationship they uh, said that, that we must have a law for this if it is necessary it was there uh, in 2011 and again this was in 2020 in january there was another conference and i was surprised the what were whatever was the agenda at that time this was again the agenda drawn and i was invited to deliver the opening speech there at uh, delhi but at that time not uh, covid but i was seriously ill at the time and therefore couldn't go i prepared a speech and only sent it to them and reminded at the time that in 2011 you have a conference an international conference you frame the, the, the same topic is taken and you have all the formulations all the recommendations also given and then 2020 10 years later you have the same agenda how is it happening if those recommendations had any value and if the government was required to see and if it had not seen what is the purpose in having another one why will you not carry therefore a movement to make it happen to implement so i don't know how they responded but i know it happened uh, i don't know whether it was because of the january can- conference in 2020 there is uh, now mm, it came in a different way uh, our parliament is uh, several pre- preoccupations to therefore to think of a stand alone legislation they did not uh, think it viable therefore they made it epidemic D- diseases amendment ordinance 2020 therefore you have the 19th uh, century enactment uh, and brought with some key amendments and that amendment contained a provision the amendment uh, says it, apart from preventing the spread of dangerous epidemic diseases or what there are provisions the um, the ordinance amends an act to include protections for healthcare personnel uh, to combat who are involved in combating the diseases and the protection obtains this way that no person can commit or abet uh, abet the commission of uh, act of violence to any healthcare professional uh, and uh, they punish now of the punishment which is there for a person is uh, up to a period of 3 months and uh, compensation uh, which can be awarded to a tune of about 2 lakhs rupees the fine was between uh, 50 50000 to 2 lakhs um, fine alone and compensation is independent thing which has come about this is the, the kind of translation of uh, the new um, approach to victimology we we have even the amendment in the criminal procedure code uh, which uh, contemplates uh, compensation to victims of uh, crimes so therefore we have uh, it is possible for a court to be granting Uh, compensation independently to a doctor or hospital which is uh, affected by any act of violence against a doctor or the hospital so therefore that's a new provision which has come it could have been an independent act which will uh, prevail for everyone uh, but it has been restricted only to the health personnel who are involved in this epidemic this is so what happens now if uh, we find a, a cure for covid and if there is a vaccine and we are not um, 
troubled by this kind of epidemic, but there are other problems still subs uh, which subsist. Uh, can this act be invoked? Perhaps not. Uh, so therefore, we must look for something else, um, a general law which would uh, address those concerns. Because uh, I, I receive um, in, uh, communications, I receive uh, information from several doctors about the problems that they have, how they get taunted at various places because I've kept some live contact with many doctors and doctors in organizations. And therefore I get these kind of concerns expressed. And uh, um, it is sure enough a problem is what we must know that uh, in our, because you're all young students of uh, law, uh, as you will at some point of time come, uh, we should be at all times mindful of uh, how uh, the doctor's concerns must also be addressed properly, understood properly, and just not move on a knee-jerk reaction if somebody comes and says, sir, this doctor assured me of cure, it didn't happen, or I was taken to the hospital, my uncle, my somebody died, so will you take action against them? But there is a, nobody can promise a cure like that. And if some treatment fails, you must know, uh, was it on account of a very brazen act of negligence which has happened. So therefore, we need to reinforce that kind of confidence for people in doctors and doctors do also have confidence. Among other things, in my view, the reason is that insurance company don't play a proper role. This is some pet theme which keep I talk about whenever I meet with the insurance professionals. In a meeting when I was discussing about this, and there was one doctor who stood up and asked, how come, sir, I, I run a clinic uh, the insurance companies recognize only uh, treatment or billing by big companies, corporate entities like uh, Apollo or Fortis or something like that. Uh, and uh, if, if the person takes a treatment uh, under me, I would have probably billed them about 200 rupees, 300 rupees, and then give prescribe some medicines and left them off. Now they go to this hospital, they charge, they run them through so many tests and uh, bill them in several lakhs of rupees. And that will be reimbursed because that is what an employer will recognize because uh, this is through approved hospitals. This approved hospital is a big uh, uh, game. It's a, it's a kind of uh, uh, lobbying for these approvals from government. And they tie up with the insurance companies and only those insurance companies will provide for a cashless scheme only to those hospitals. They have a list of hospitals at all time. How will it be fair? Are we treating all the doctors equally is what he was asking, but truly a concern. Uh, among other things, even in cases where there is an insurance, where a doctor uh, uh, takes an insurance policy, uh, we, we notice that uh, when a claim is made, somebody has something, the doctor uh, uh, the, it was assured something, it didn't happen, there was negligence, let us assume there was even negligence. And uh, the insurance companies, always contest every claim. You, If you go and see in any consumer forum, you'll be surprised that uh, about 20 to 25% of cases, I'm not giving a random figure. It's I know this to be the Delhi example, and therefore it should be somewhere, somewhere in that direction. If you look at again the volume of case law, you will notice that there is a large number of cases pending before the consumer forums only against doctors. They keep questioning. Are not lawyers more negligent than doctors in the way uh, they handle the uh, clients? Uh, do they assure success at all times? Let's not even talk about success. I have known and seen opinions of uh, lawyers which are outstandingly bad, uh, that uh, you advise persons without uh, minding that there are uh, difference in uh, the succession laws for uh, Muslims and Christians and Hindus. Uh, and you will apply one scheme of law to another and all that kind of things will happen and no questions asked. The, the court will ultimately say the case is dismissed in the circumstances, no cost. That's what they'll say. They will not even award cost for a brazen negligence of a, doc, a lawyer. But then uh, these are questions they're asking and the insurance companies will uh, uh, contest. Now, then one area which I want you to examine because you're all students, now and then I need to not necessarily quiz you, but uh, give you some scope for further research. Uh, the American law for uh, insurance companies have gone very differently. Uh, the Supreme Court of Florida and Supreme Court of uh, Texas have taken unusual decisions, uh, which are the other side of the Uberima Friday. 
ibrima fides you know it's a bona fide uh, thing you need to disclose everything of what you know a patient in a insurance contract a contract of ins insurance is a contract of ibrima fides is what the, your uh, teacher would have told you and so the point is that you are bound to disclose everything more than uh, what is even you thought was essential you need to declare everything about your state of health and uh, if there is uh, some non disclosure which is seen as relevant Uh, it is irrelevant that the insurer did not ask whether you suffered from a particular thing but you needed to disclose it is what is important they have taken this to be the other side the, the corollary for that the, the the two supreme courts of what i mentioned there and which is again the prevalent law there uh, is that the insurance companies there is a duty of bona fide defense so if a claim is made against the insurer there must be a bona fide defense if it comes to court and it should not come to court that's what the supreme court uh, there in texas said it said uh, nobody shall be compelled to come to court because it's a contractual obligation uh, is the insurance company there for anything other than for payment they are in business only to make payment to satisfy the claims of persons when they make the claim they are not there only to uh, collect all the premium right so therefore uh, they said if uh, yeah, insurer does not rush they use the expression if they do not rush compromise uh, they do not provide the compensation in the manner which is asked and defy a person to go to court and ultimately the court finds the compensation is to be given then the court has a power to award additional damages equivalent to the damage claimed so therefore it can be double the amount of what is claimed supposing the insurance policy provides for 10 lakhs of rupees then it is possible to even uh, open the lid uncap the liability which is restricted under the contractual term and make him liable for twice that amount this is how the court has uh, the courts have held and therefore the plea of uh, uh, the insurance company will always be tested whether he had made proposal for a compromise whether the claim is properly considered now we must move somewhere in that direction i have known any number of cases with the doctors who have insurance policies the insurance company will be driving the litigation through defense for the doctor taking up all claims uh, all claims uh, all defenses we make no endeavor at all to settle because uh, by allowing for many times the doctors are worried about the disinformation and the adverse publicity which may result through any adverse decision of the tribunals or the courts and therefore they take a stiff contest they engage very senior lawyers they do all kind of stuff uh, but then a compromise uh, term which can be completely confidential where you don't need to say uh, what is the compromise amount which has been arrived at whether the, it was uh, dismissed or allowed you keep nothing the case can be withdrawn when a compromise is done insurance companies must see the major uh, revenue of what they secure uh, through health insurance Uh, they pay hardly about less than 10% of the premium of what they collect is what they pay as uh, as uh, amounts due under this uh, health policies so um, that is something which because the insurance companies don't do probably at some point of time um, when you are appearing as, uh, as a lawyer for either the insurance company or uh, for a claimant you should at all times try and see whether it is possible to initiate a dialogue with the insurance companies and uh, make it possible to settle that has not happened and that is the reason how the doctors get completely troubled many doctors now take insurance but they all think when the case is made they have to go and defend themselves i know of a doctor in uh, apollo who is a surgeon a prominent surgeon who says that he has been contesting a case for the last 6 years and i know this person personally and uh, because of some uh, hand surgery we failed and a person has a case i was asking if there, is there not an insurance i said i have an insurance then what did the insurance company do the insurance company only engaged a lawyer for me to present the, the version but uh, they said they will take care was there not any endeavor to settle he said no nothing no such thing was ever done so therefore these kind of things happen that's uh, the reason why the doctors get tormented is what i'm ultimately coming to um, with reference uh, to as the uh, apart from the insurance companies there is uh, in the manner of treatment between doctors and uh, other persons there is one area which is the mental health care act of 2017 uh, does i believe it is even uh, a part of your curriculum 
it's a quite a large area for study and i'm not going to be now telling of uh, you know, all the provisions but i thought something which is uh, important is that uh, healthcare now uh, this act contains a new provision which is very important it uh, contemplates a, a situation of advanced directive um, what, what do we understand by that advanced directive has important meaning other in other provisions as well i'll just come to it for one reason and um, it, it is a famous uh, hollywood movie uh, one one flew in the cuckoo's nest or something like that uh, where uh, there is a person who is mentally uh, ill who is taken to the hospital the kind of treatment which is given they will be giving shocks to him now this mental health care uh, act even talks about what kind of treatment must be given it talks about the institutionalization is wrong and therefore you should have home care for the person it will not be taken as a stigma ever and among other things or the constitution provisions are also brought in there the right to equality and non discrimination is provided there these are all unusual provisions that medical medically ill person the mentally ill persons will be treated differently because previously the lunacy act was substituted by the mental health act they removed the word lunatic from the realm of law Uh, they thought it was uh, it had the, an innuendo attached you will not use that kind of a slur against any person lunatic is not a correct expression at all is mental um, uh, mentally affected mental health care um, health is what they said mental health act now even that has uh, not been found to be sufficient and uh, therefore we have the health care act which looks at it very differently and among other provisions the provision is uh, shall be treated as equal persons with physical illness that's an important thing uh, somewhere there is a reluctance for persons to be saying that is mental uh, mental we use it in all kind of expression these uh, these days we don't even use the things i was blinded by, by faith we don't use, use even those expressions like blind blind we don't say visually challenged we say we trying to substitute with more um, neutral terms therefore the mental health care again it talks about even the treatment the, the same way as a physical illness will be treated is how mental health will be addressed and that's how the treatment will be there the advanced directives also are important it talks about it gives a lease it to the government to stipulate how the uh, advanced directives will be given but uh, it is important a mental a person who is mentally uh, affected can declare Uh, during his lucid intervals as to how he wants to be treated you can say i will not nobody will administer shock to me it's possible for him to declare even otherwise they can't do doctors don't employ these methods uh, but then that will be drawn there i don't want to be brought to the hospital he can declare that if i want to be treated i will be treated only by this doctor you can make that make that kind of a declaration therefore it contains important uh, provisions or it is making possible even for a guardian to declare how it should be done so therefore uh, it contains uh, empowering provisions and among other things uh, there is a particular provision which was what was talked about uh, in the parliament when they said attempt to suicide will not be any longer an offense we know section 309 still exists uh, what would you have expected you if you find that a person commits suicide if he dies there is nothing after all you can't uh, prosecute a dead person obviously uh, we are talking about a person who survives this kind of uh, incident of uh, an attempt to suicide and we all always say oh, oh sick person the person is so weak the person couldn't stand this this is what we say so therefore this act brings a uh, the mental health act contains some provision which i'll just now take up because just this morning before i arrived uh, your professor asked me to see if i can also make some uh, reference about the men mental health care therefore i'm making some impromptu comments about that when i'm talking about insurance companies to some care for the people uh, it says uh, section 115 of this mental health care uh, act contains a presumption 114 evidence act con uh, contemplates some presumptions remember therefore 114 115 under the health care act contain some provision it says uh, notwithstanding anything contained in the section 309 ipc so therefore if you are protecting them in whatever way it exists that 309 will continue to be there uh, it says any person who attempts 
and to commit suicide shall be presumed unless otherwise proved to have severe stress and shall not be tried and punished under the said code so therefore uh, under 309 if a person before a person is uh, prosecuted uh, you will still see uh, whether this prosecution is necessary he was in a, such a serious stress that uh, uh, he need there will be a presumption of stress uh, look at this uh, almost seems like an obvious thing isn't it Uh, that a person commits suicide can he ever be committing suicide or attempting to commit suicide unless he was in a state of severe stress uh, then you somewhere see that stress must again be seen through the prism of what this enactment contains or what this mental stress is about to such an extent that a person is in some way incapable of taking uh, proper decisions uh, it would seem therefore a, a person who is affected by say some love failure which gets to be invariably a reason where people take to such extreme lengths as though life is there only for that love for that person these are all unfortunate things that you need to be uh, um, canvassing for love in life is fine uh, but then you don't get it from a particular person you end up uh, you end your life is an unfortunate thing it is just that a person required appropriate and assistance and it, it didn't get that this provision could have been easily even without this 115 this enactment could have provided for repeal of 309 instead you preserve 309 and make a presumption so you, you may be wondering after all now uh, i have not known too many cases where attempt to suicide has ever been taken as an offense and any police prosecution is there it's not like that you now know uh, for whatever good or bad reason some journalist is being hounded for not attempt to suicide for abetment of suicide these kind of things can happen you can you can use that kind of provision by for any reason to create a harassment all that is possible in fact for the same reason many people are saying if there is a consensual sex between persons of uh, the same gender uh, how many persons were prosecuted in section 377 was a question but for uh, for many of us who are heterosexuals or who do not have uh, homosexual propensities this provision probably didn't mean anything it is like the same thing about emergency a person who was a political person who didn't have very strong views about things wanted only the trains to be running all right emergency was also all right they were all saying great things about em emergency but then who were politically active persons who had very strong views strong expression and the meaning for democracy obtains to dissent and therefore uh, if they they can be affected the same way 377 if those persons who have homosexual tendencies if they could be hounded through prosecution if there is a threat that is good enough that is or that is bad enough uh, situation that we will not have any provision or law even the smallest minority can be affected and that is how the first judgment was de decided in kaushal they decided in a way which is completely untenable the supreme court uh, with justice singhvi and uh, probably mukhopadhyay Uh, they held is such a minuscule population. What are we trying to do? We will not do anything with the parliament to do. That was a completely um, uh, disowning responsibility when it was required of the Supreme Court to pronounce. And thankfully, we had a later judgment which is reviewed. Reviewed that judgment was an application for review was there, and then they uh, referred it to a larger bench. And you had all the judges uh, writing separate opinions there, except one who. went with another who was always the person who always uh, also uh, accepted and went with the chief justice now you will read the judgment you said you will notice that everyone had very strong reasons to say as to how it was completely wrong the same way we ought to have provided for a complete repeal of 3 309 instead we keep 309 say not withstanding 309 you have 115 presumption uh, is still inadequate uh, and now flagging this only because as students we must be able to look beyond um, a simple statement of law we should be able to critically appraise things we should be able to critically examine every provision and say how it is not correct cultivate also the trait now for you uh, even as you are studying to look at any judgment with a critical eye many of practitioners of law uh, will only be looking for oh this is a favorable judgment for me this is not favorable i'll discard we don't take the next step of seeing how this judgment is wrong we don't even say about that if it's a subordinate court we'll say it is wrong we'll take it and appeal if it is the high court you still say no it can go to supreme court supreme court is never wrong because it is final that's the way we approach 
we should be thinking that Supreme Court judgment could be wrong in umpteen reasons for umpteen things. And we need that open mind in academic circles at least. And that is again a pity that we don't have uh, good books and good articles coming from the academic community. If there are books written, they are still written by old people like me. There need to be persons, young persons, who must be taking active participation and see what is wrong, what is uh, not correct. So therefore, in, in probably in your research, if there is a, a student studying a mental health act, they must make a, a, an article. They must say as to how 115 presumption is inadequate, how it can still be wrong uh, to keep 309. That kind of a scope this surely offers. Uh, advanced directive, I said, and therefore I'll take it to uh, relatively another thing which has come about. Advanced directive, which is coming through this enactment in the Mental Health Care Act, uh, legitimized something. Uh, there was something called as a living will. An advanced directive is also in a uh, in. Um, I don't know whether it is a legal parlance in some, probably in a common parlance, it was called as a living will. It may seem uh, an oxymoron. Uh, will is invariably a, a testament of a dead person. He speaks from the grave. When, what do you mean by living will? Uh, living will is a will which takes effect during the time when a person was living. So how can a will take place when a person is living? Yeah, that is what it is called as a living will. Living will is a kind of an advanced directive, uh, which is... Uh, brought through advanced directives apart from the act, it gains a legitimacy in a judgment in, uh, in a judgment reported in 2018, common causes versus uh, common cause versus union of India. Common cause incidentally was um, Shauri, the Arun Shauri's father uh, was involved in that as an active person. Yeah, I think he's pa he passed away a few years back, uh, but he has brought uh, to center stage several important uh, issues, public issues through decisions. And uh, this, uh, through this decision, through this case, uh, was an attempt to uh, rewrite something of what was uh, brought through uh, Arunash uh, uh, case, which was there in Chanbag, uh, the Justice Kaju at that time, at a time when he was taken rather seriously, not like what, is, what has happened now, what, how it has degenerated, the way we look at uh, Justice Kaju's pronouncements in several places and his tweets. He tweets for... Uh, uh, finding uh, uh, bridegrooms or brides and things. So therefore, it's uh, at his age is uh, doing that. But uh, now, uh, if you were taking him uh, seriously at the time, uh, he made a very sensitive judgment about uh, a nurse uh, who was uh, treated badly. This uh, uh, Anna Shanba case probably everyone knows, and uh, that was a case about uh, a nurse. Uh, during the time when uh, she had uh, uh, menstruation, uh, she was uh, beaten by a club, sodomized and uh, tied to a chain. And uh, she became um, seriously, she went into comatose state, never to come back till she died a few years back. At the time when the case was decided, she, had still, uh, she was still alive. And uh, that case uh, said, among other things, when they concluded the judgment, uh, whether a person could be... Uh, still administered with the treatment or it was possible to withdraw life support. That was the point. A journalist had taken the case uh, to the Supreme Court um, who said that this person, poor person, has been languishing there in the hospital under the care of an institution. Uh, thanks to those persons that uh, particular hospital which was prepared to devote the time to this uh, person. But she is uh, leading a, a miserable life. And therefore, withdraw the life support. The question was, was it possible to withdraw life support or, or would it amount to suicide? Would it amount to abetment to suicide? Would it amount to aiding a suicide? Was the question. Because um, this is, again, that a person can uh, embrace death peacefully. Um, is uh, euthanasia is much discussed a thing. In Holland, it's possible for a person to die if you go to the doctor and say, no, my, my life is miserable, therefore inject me medicine to kill me. Uh, it is possible. There is nothing wrong. In fact, somebody in Hall, uh, uh, the example in Holland was translated sometime later. Um, this is also in the book, which I have written, um, is there. Uh, when Katrina, Katrina was, uh, uh, not the Katrina we know, it was, um, uh, it was the name that was given to a 
tornado or a cyclone probably where there was a huge devastation water coming in beach water coming sea water coming in and things several houses were inundated many people lost their lives so persons were put in various camps and uh, one particular doctor identified four persons who had been suffering so he administered some medicine to kill them all and when he was asked what did you do uh, instead of treating those persons and then uh, rec- uh, helping them recover what were you doing so the person said they were in miserable condition they they were poor they couldn't be affording anything the government aid was not sufficient for them so i thought i'll dispatch them immediately and then i, I killed them and that's what the somebody said that uh, the the court the american court that did not agree with that and said the holland principle will not be applied here so therefore all these things were also in aruna's case uh, they they considered that and they said it will left it to the government to decide until the government brought a legislation the court will decide in every situation whether withdrawal of life support could be done or not now uh, they said in a judgment which was in uh, this common cause they said it is not necessary only for the court to decide it is perfectly possible to lay down guidelines uh, it is uh, we all know that uh, judicial activism uh, the the good side of it is uh, makes room for the courts to bring out laws um set down guidelines where there is a legislative deficit in the area so therefore this uh, living uh, uh, bill was actually brought even a reference to the living bill is there but the pity is the kind of judgment which you if you only read uh, it's written again by uh, all uh, it's a five member five uh, judges uh, ruling and uh, you find four judges have uh, given separate opinions with the chief justice deepak mishra at the time with kanvilkar uh, saying yes to him um, such uh, the the first par- the the first judgment itself runs to some 135 pages and uh, such a difficult method of giving reference to it i was asking after this judgment because i passionately advocated for passive euthanasia uh, withdrawal of life support and i assisted the pandit the, uh, the pg mar at chandigarh to have a protocol for withdrawal of life support actually if you go to private hospitals they will not let a person die or if a person has died they will continue administering medicines even after a person has died because it's going to increase the bill a doctor hearing this who is associated with any of the big corporate hospitals may he may be you will take serious umbrage at what i'm saying but that is the truth that they don't easily let a person die but in government hospitals just as the person is dying they will find a pers- way of jettisoning that person because you don't need to ad- admit yet another person there is always a suspicion therefore of patients and the families whether the best treatment is given in the government hospital or they finding a re- method of putting out a person in order that the bed is occupied by somebody else who is known to some doctor or known to some politician or known to some big wig so these are uh, bigger issues and therefore you need to have definite considerations in this advanced directive what they said um, if only this this is to be applied uh, that person who died by merely knowing what kind of directive has to be if you and i must think let us leave some young boys like you you or girls like you own mind you won't think of advanced directive why must be thinking of those kind of advanced directives of my age do i not so there it requires uh, uh, i need to uh, have this advanced directive made and it has to be authenticated by a doctor so the doctor must first say that i am in a position to give the directive at a time when i am not afflicted with any serious uh, mental condition that clouds my proper thinking and the objective assessment of why i am saying the directive must be there and after this is authenticated by a doctor i must take it to a magistrate and the magistrate must notarize it Uh, have you ever gone to any magistrate the office and uh, the court and then tried to secure any signature attested by a ma- magistrate you will you will never think of coming to court again so therefore it's such a tough process eh? going to a magistrate getting through those defedas uh, to get it across your doc to magistrate who size you up from top to, from crown to toe and decide it is not the time for him to be disturbed uh, by persons like you such small persons coming in there so therefore this has to be notarized by magistrate now after this is done a copy will have to be taken it has to be sent to revenue office why revenue office yeah revenue officer must know that anyway and uh, again it should be taken to the district judge district judge will have a depository keeping all these advance directives i have asked at least five judges in district courts 
whether there is any registry that they have in any of the districts, whether uh, they have received any such copy. Nobody has received. I have not heard of any revenue officer ever receiving anything. From the time the judgment is given to 2018 to now, he gave me one instance where somebody has given an advance directive and then had it notarized. An impossible judgment. A judgment which is so important is giving such directions which are hopeless. Hopelessly difficult for anyone to have a directive implemented. I had a strange experience. I was addressing a group of doctors at uh, Punjab University for a lecture in, last year. At that time, uh, a person, a very old person, 92 years, as he was coming towards the end of my lecture, uh, I was thinking, uh, I, I didn't know who it was. I was not able to recognize that everyone else there seen in the crowd seemed to be knowing him kind of popularity that person had in Chandigarh. So when he was addressing, he told me something very strange. He said, uh, sir, uh, whatever you spoke, I didn't hear. Uh, but I've come here, I'm 92 years old. I'm short of hearing. And I had been a director of PG Mar. And at 92 years, all persons around me have been either my patients or persons who have, or my students, if they are doctors. They have immense respect for me. And therefore, my fear, sir. He said, my fear is if I fall ill, I'm 92 years, I'm bound to fall ill soon. Uh, if I fall ill, I will not be allowed to die, nor will the death be declared. They'll keep me in the hospital and then prolong my suffering for a lot more time. My son in, uh, is in USA who may not immediately come or I don't know when he will come. Uh, but then these people will uh, torment me in my dying days. How do I ensure that they don't torment and that I die peacefully? Look at that as a doctor. He also told me, you don't need to give me any answer because I can't hear you. Send it by email to me or what I'll do. I had the 2018 judgment. When I, If I were to write the 2018 judgment and give also the reasons, I thought you'd die immediately. I didn't therefore uh, refer to that. And I gave some direction. I don't know what you did. God let him live for 100 more years. He's still there. So therefore, these are the concerns of persons who even want to have those advanced directives implemented. Now, if you have a, a reason for common cause to be applied, probably it's very difficult to apply. Uh, there is uh, uh, another area uh, of what I have discussed previously uh, in my book and what, where, from where. Um, I'm only addressing those things where we have taken from the time of what I have said in my book to several things which have changed. I've only identified those areas. Uh, now, on surrogacy, my concern at our all times has been that we have no law and therefore um, we are uh, driven through ad hoc uh, approaches by the courts. And there was one uh, baby Manji's case where uh, a Japanese couple had uh, entered into a contract surrogacy agreement with some person. The child, when it, before the child was born, and the Japanese couple had separated. Therefore, only when the child was born, only the father, the, the man arrived. The woman had by that time divorced her husband. Therefore, she was not interested in claiming the child. So the, how, how do you take back the child? How does the, the original permission had been, the contract had been with another person? So therefore, an application had been filed in court saying, I brought my mother who will take care. The, the man had to declare that uh, he is uh, uh, employed somewhere and uh, the home care will be given by his own mother. Uh, luckily for in Japan, the average lifespan is very high and therefore an old woman at 80 is still a young woman there. So therefore it was possible the court also accepted, yes, the child can be given there. But the problem was, it, uh, another instance of what had happened through Nevada was uh, that they had an uh, agreement, they had a surrogate child when they went to uh, Japan, there was a problem about registering because Japan does not recognize surrogacy. So a surrogate ag uh, agreements, it does not recognize. Therefore, they were unwilling to take back the child and said that the child cannot be brought, taken back to USA to where the child came from. So therefore, I don't know what had happened to this child which, whose father ob obtained uh, permission from the Supreme Court. But then that, that, that was a situation of uh, allowing for surrogacy agreements without knowing what is the status, what is going to be the status, can the child be easily taken away. Now look at another ca case in Janba. Uh, there was another case from um, from Gujarat, and uh, this was about uh, in the district of Anand. Uh, a German couple had uh, uh, entered into a surrogacy agreement with the local person, and uh, they had twins. 
uh, the the surrogacy uh, agreement uh, yielded ultimately on implantation and the fertilization of egg in the uh, woman uh, in indian woman there she had twins and she didn't want to be burdened with these uh, two children so she abandoned these two children and went away after delivering the child she had collected whatever money was uh, offered and she had gone the problem was the the, before the children could be taken, the birth certificate had to be taken because you'll have to apply to the embassy. The embassy had the birth certificate, in, uh, the corporation, the municipality there in Anand had recorded the mother, the biological mother who gave birth to a child as a mother and the father's name, the German. Imagine uh, as though they are husband and wife. The, they didn't give the other, the German wife as the mother they gave the name of this person. Therefore, an application had been filed before the municipality for changing the entry, substituting the Indian mother's name to the German mother's name because the German father's name had been given as the father. Uh, the municipality didn't do, therefore went to the high court from there to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has passed some interim directions. It has not been disposed of yet, it is still there. They said, now we direct uh, the change to be made we are not, however, giving any any bigger directions that in all cases that it can be only like that. The permission is uh, take, given for uh, visa to be issued and the child uh, to be taken with these two persons referred to as guardians for them. They have not treated as parents yet. And now with all these concerns, the, there is now a bill which was introduced in 2019, which was an important bill. Surprisingly, you, for everything you need to lobby for certain things. There is a powerful lobby there. Um, which is thriving in this uh, surrogacy business uh, of foreigners coming here in India and taking surrogacy help and uh, exploitation is obvious in these cases because it's a big business. It is uh, some of uh, the Huffington's, Huffington's Post, it uh, estimates that this to be $800 million business in India. And that is the kind of money which the hospitals and the doctors are making through surrogacy agreements. Some places in Madhya Pradesh, in uh, Gujarat, and Mumbai is very prominent. A lot of activities, a lot of hospitals uh, deal with this. And this 2019 um, bill, it was introduced in uh, the Lok Sabha on 19, 15th of July 2019. Unfortunately, um, it was it was passed, fortunately. And then, uh, but what had happened was when it went to Rajya Sabha, it was, they referred to a, a committee for uh, examination. So therefore, uh, it has gone. That bill provides for only um, there can't be um, altruistic, uh, that uh, there can't be commercial surrogacy, obviously. That's how the legislation will look at it. Uh, same way that uh, transplantation can't be for commercial uh, consideration. And they said also, among other things, um, only relatives can be donors. Uh, can be non-relative, cannot be the same way as you. The inspiration probably came through the uh, organ, organ Transplantation Act. Only relatives could be Relatives who are altruistically inclined can be donors. And uh, there could be, uh, and the persons who can obtain this uh, could be only heterosexual uh, persons. There should be heterosexual Indians, which means a foreigner cannot uh, come and take things. Of those examples of what we have, there was also uh, one Israeli uh, hom uh, homosexual, uh, two males who arrived in India to have a child. They took it back. Uh, to Israel. Israel is again not a country which recognizes uh, surrogacy. Therefore, it was in some court litigation. So uh, hospitals which register for uh, surrogacy arrangements, they don't even see whether the persons who are approaching them, they are living in a country where surrogacy is accepted. Will the child uh, obtain legitimacy and uh, an easy trans, uh, transmission from one country to another? It is just not their concern as long as they are able to make things work and they are able to secure a child for the person, they are, they are happy with that. Now, this legislation therefore takes care of that, wants to see that foreign, foreigners can't have, it is possible only for heterosexual, mark the word, heterosexual uh, Indians. Now, what do you do about um, homosexuals? No, this it is not possible. Uh, what do you do uh, about um, the situation? Now, if you have ever known, we understand so many things through Hollywood. So therefore, uh, um, Karan Johar uh, was um, uh, declared homosexual, uh, and uh, he has a surrogacy, he has a child through surrogacy. Um, so therefore, if uh, this law had come into force, he couldn't have had Sushmita Sen, 
uh, a world beauty uh, has a child. She is not married. So uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible. It is possible only to those couples who are married and who do not have children for a period of five years. Uh, so the bill contains several things which are seriously objectionable because now it is available before a select committee. Uh, some of you must read this. Uh, you must read what the provisions are. See what is appropriate. Now, again, this does not take notice of a thing. They are restricted to only to Indians. Uh, but then the problem could still be that uh, you don't need to arrive in India to have uh, a woman impregnated through artificial fertilization through the IVF procedure. It is possible for a person to uh, send the semen in a box in a crypto. Uh, it's properly packed and sent. And that can be uh, appropriately injected and a woman can be made uh, pregnant and a child will be born with a salmon brought from some other country and that person will come to India as though not, he had not known. He will identify the person where a child is born and apply for uh, recording him as an uh, uh, adoptive parent under the uh, inter-country adoptions. And there again you have some reasons. The Supreme Court from the time when it was uh, passing an order in uh, Lakshmi Khan Pandey in 1984. Lot of changes they had. They had CARA as a child adoption uh, regulatory authority, uh, which would decide on whether a person could uh, be taken as an adoptive parent or not. But in all these cases, you must remember, uh, we are still survived to the complexion. We have a problem. Uh, if it's a white person coming to the court and asking for something, we generally the courts think it is acceptable, it is necessary. That's how the Supreme Court decided in ANOCA, um, in inter-country adoption where Kara had refused that the child will not be taken an adoption to those persons without seeing whether there could be an Indian parent who could adopt. The Supreme Court said, uh, we have seen, we have heard these persons, uh, they seem to have um, cultivated a friendship to a rickshaw puller when they had arrived in India, when they were traveling to the, when they were being taken by Richard to the hotel. Uh, they made friendship with the person that wife was prepared to be a surrogate uh, uh, mother. They have a, uh, uh, they had a child, not surrogacy, they had a child. They were prepared to hand over the child to these persons. And it's good, these, uh, these are affluent persons from foreign country, the child must be given. It was against the Supreme Court's directives, the way the intercountry adoption must be done. After creating an authority and after laying down guidelines, the Supreme Court found that as a, a foreigner, we can give. That's what would happen at some point of time. So therefore, these kind of, even in the bill, because it has not become an act, which is an important area for activity, legislative activity, it does not happen. We'll probably consider that and see. And, uh, and uh, I, I would uh, probably, there's one, uh, one area which I will say, and then because I see that I'm coming close to my time, a lot of time, uh, the forensic uh, issues of evidence, I think you, you must know, that's an interesting area. Uh, more so now, in the way uh, post Nirbhaya, we have criminal law amendment, which does not require penetration of the sexual organ. Uh, it is possible to, um, in any of the orifices of a person, of a woman, uh, if a person uh, places finger in a ear even, that could, uh, that could be an offense under section 376 and will fall within the definition of 375. In Sakshi at the previous time, uh, non-penetrative uh, intrusion against consent was sought and there an argument was made that must also be declared as sexual offenses and the 375 as it had happened in other countries. The Supreme Court rejected the plea and say, now it has to be taken, a, de a decision has to come through this, uh, the parliament and the parliament has come through that. Now it is very crucial, therefore, uh, it, unlike at the previous time, where we have also changes which says necessarily, it's not necessary that there must, I mean, it is not necessary that there should be any violence practiced on a person because the statistics is 90% uh, of cases are cases where sexual uh, offenses take place or by persons who know the offender. And, and in respect of uh, Children, it's even more. It's somewhere close to 95% of cases are cases which are done by persons who have known who have known them. So therefore, uh, there are so many methods. Uh, the person could be driven to extreme uh, fear. Uh, some children against whom it is practiced, they may not even know what has happened. Uh, they are not even um, mature enough to know uh, what that intrusion meant. 
that the person did not have any enjoyment, but the other person seemed. And what have I done wrong? Why am I not able to participate in the pleasure? Those kind of concerns, the trauma, what happens under POXO, if only you have known those cases uh, through any clinical history, if you have seen, you would know. I've had occasion to know conducting some workshops. Uh, but that keeping that aside, now uh, the forensic evidence of collecting, gathering details, uh, it could be in several ways. When I'm talking about forensic evidence, I'm talking about examination, the medical examination, which will lead to DNA profiling, for instance. Uh, where uh, uh, the semen is collected. Now, what do you, what happens in a situation where uh, a person uses a condom? Leaving a condom at the place, probably like uh, Dr. Red, Reddy uh, would say in a workshop, leaving a condom at the place is like leaving a visiting card at the place. He leaves everything there. So uh, it's not like that. Then there could be a, a digital evidence of phone usage. Um, the internet usage. What is he? What is he uh, normally viewing? Uh, what are the communications which are sent? And the use of the social platform like Twitter, the Facebook. Uh, what are his interests? Uh, to look for every Instagram or uh, the bite marks. Everything obtained enormous significance, and all these have significant uh, scientific advancements. Uh, they are now trying to save in cases where. Uh, there is a mixture uh, of uh, semen with the fluid of the woman. It is not very easy. There is a probability of how we must give. The reports will have to be very clear. And therefore, uh, the, in a special committee for the advice to the president, US president, they've given reports as to how the opinion must be written. In many situations, you will find unusual assertions made by doctors that this belongs to this person in kind of DNA, while a child, whether it is the child of these two persons, there can be a hundred percent um, correctness. But then when we are talking about whether it is this person's semen, which is there through a DNA, uh, whether what is seen there, uh, was it uh, referable to this person? Or when there is a kind of a mixture to split and then examine whether it is of these two persons and what they are, it could be somebody else also. So therefore, there have been situations like that where uh, several decisions had been uh, reversed in important countries looking at the ultimate scientific evidence. And DNA is uh, not 100%. If there is 99.99 and there is a not one person there, and that kind of a sure uh, if it, surety cannot be 100%, then it's not merely preponderance of probability when we are seeing. We are seeing an absolute proof beyond reasonable doubt is what we are seeing. So therefore, and there is a benefit of doubt. If there is a doubt of even 0.1%, not 0.01%, why will not the benefit go is how an argument will be brought. So look for every other forensic details of what I was saying, the port connections and all. All that will become relevant in these days when we're talking about forensic evidence. Of that particular thing, with this, I will uh, close also. Uh, of bite mark, uh, bite mark evidence. Now um, there is a we have a, a lot of difference there. The way we understand, it's a kind of a pattern. People believed that uh, uh, matching a bite mark with a particular uh, dentition. We are talking about uh, dental dentition is what we say. Uh, with a particular dentu dentition, will uh, assume significance because a human dentition is unique. That was the assumption. Uh, the skin can accurately record the uniqueness of how that mark is. Uh, the skin can take that. It gets red, it, uh, uh, it's swollen, then it gets pronounced. Uh, that is uh, the, the second thing. And now uh, this, uh, this can again be, uh, these assumptions were found to be not scientific. They said because a skin can be stretched at the time uh, the, where a person is pulled by other side in a stretched condition, what could happen? So these are uh, sure problems. And uh, bite mark is now ultimately the American Association. Forget about their elections and their, in, uh, their inability to do it properly. Uh, but uh, doctors and other persons, the research of what U.S. is prepared to give is enormous. Uh, and uh, exceedingly important that we understand through how the researchers have gone. They said this is completely wrong. It is flawed. Bite marks have nothing unique. Uh, the dentition is, not, is again nothing unique. You won't be able to say anything. They are reversing all decisions on the bite mark. 
But if there is a report like that and it is again submitted to the US Supreme Court and to all the courts, uh, they circulated the, the scientific researches. In India, somewhere the courts are eternally and at all times distance from science. Uh, we take several things which are unscientific. And in a Supreme Court judgment in the Mukesh, this Nirbhaya case, uh, you know, the, the words expressed was uh, something like this. Uh, this is in Mukesh's estate. That was in 2017 uh, a judgment, even while convicting. They said something like this. Uh, forensic uh, odontology has established itself as an important and indispensable science in medical legal matters. This is what Justice Banamati said, completely wrong. It is not at all correct. By the time when she wrote the judgment, there was already enough proof and all decisions were getting reversed elsewhere. And the same, uh, we were applying it there. And uh, in fact, even in my previous book in Modi's jurisprudence, I said, now this is, I pointed this out. I had missed out. That's where I uh, missed out important scientific discoveries by the process. That's not the way. Uh, that is not even correct. And again, the same way in two finger th theory, uh, whether a person, in a situation where sexual penetration is not necessary, uh, that's completely becoming irrelevant whether a person attempted to insert uh, any part of it in vagina. That's a different thing. But the Supreme Court again says something where it had discarded even early in 2002 that two finger theory, whether fingers uh, or uh, they're easily admi uh, admitted in the vaginal orifice. It's irrelevant, they said. But the Supreme Court says later, the medical evidence shows that labia majoria, and this was in uh, Kishan Kumar Malik, uh, they legitimize every investigation of what is deeply flawed and incorrect. So therefore, these kind of decisions, when they happen, they happen because wrong arguments are proposed and the judge does not know. That a judge does not know is not un unusual. That's perfectly legitimate. I've declared it many times. I don't know. Please guide me. The lawyers are supposed to know, do that research and come there. A judge only knows several cases and your case also. But your case, you must know better. So therefore, the lawyer's ability is invariably the reason why a good judgment gets to be written. The bad judgments or wrong decisions come about because there is poor research. And that will not be party to that kind of research is what I would think. And uh, I also said, why do men rape? Uh, why uh, a person, a uh, uh, COVID patient who is taken to the hospital uh, in an ambulance uh, is stopped, the ambulance is stopped midway, the person, the driver commits a rape on the person and deposits the person in the hospital. How do these kind of aberrations happen? Why do men rape? There is a book. Please secure that because I'm not going to be taking the time. At least you must know that it's not merely uh, a sexual exuberance which causes it. That uh, patriarchal mindset, that is a woman who must be punished. If there is a person who threatens that uh, uh, Murli Dharan's daughter will be raped, he's not, he won't have even seen the daughter, but he will still say that because he wants to insult, he wants to show his power. And this uh, uh, men rape uh, identifies his uh, undercover. There is a lady who has examined several, went to several uh, houses who have been rapists and found out why are they doing this. The persons who are invariably persons of very low esteem in themselves, who wanted at all times to bully because they can't do anything worthwhile. How they were treated, how their families treated the women in their houses, how every one of these factors contribute, not necessarily sexual uh, inclination. That's what the book reveals. So therefore, um, these are some of the developments of what are taking place at 12, not 2. I close. So therefore, uh, thanks for this wonderful opportunity. There are ever so many things which have simply started and then I concluded there. I'm sure there must be occasion for us to be uh, meeting some other time at some point of time when we'll always meet. And uh, to ask and to secure more, I'm sure we'll be able to gather that. So I'll leave it to your professor and uh, to Amrit uh, to take me wherever they want me to take who, whatever questions I need to handle. If I will, if I know, I will answer. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir, for this two-part uh, lecture on uh, the subject of law and medicine, especially the illustrative uh, analysis and the remarkable incidents which have happened both in the field of science and law. 
as to how this jurisprudence on this topic has been shaped and is growing and evolving something that uh, we have been able to understand there are a few questions from the students and before that uh, uh, there is probably uh, just some information to share by srishti pandey who is a third year uh, ba llb student at the law school at sastra law school i would like uh, i would like to point out how john graham's the rain maker checks every box of the insurance topic that uh, you were addressing it is a legal drama where a young lawyer fights for an insurance claim of a young boy with leukemia against a big insurance company with a big lawyer at his help so this is something that she wanted to share coming to the questions coming to the questions uh there is one there is one question on would adopting a surrogate child set a bad precedent when it comes to raising them in nations which do not recognize surrogacy and consequently surrogate children this is from akshaya sagarika who is a fifth year bba llb student along with that i think my question also what i wanted to ask uh, is also related to that the cultural sensibilities and sensitivities of uh, commercial surrogacy in a country like india yeah um could there be adoption you don't need to talk about adoption when we're talking about surrogacy because uh, the bill recognizes the commissioning parents and to be the parents and they'll be registered as such under the birth death, uh, uh, registration so previously we had uh, unlike inter country adoption where and the biological parents have to give the child in adoption in surrogacy whosoever commissions the uh, the surrogate mother uh, those persons will be treated as parents uh, as biological parents it will not be even stated that they are surrogate parents so therefore uh, there is no uh, adoption necessary uh, so therefore you don't need to worry but the problem could be um, whether it is recognized actually if they will come to india and uh, for under this act foreigners can't uh, have surrogacy if the act comes it is not possible right now it is all taking place and they adopt ways which are um, there is no sure guidelines lack of legislation makes possible any kind of adventurism that is what is happening uh, but uh, the doctors who undertake this work uh, after the bill comes it will not be possible at all for them but if they are still doing i told you where it, how it could be done they will they will do that they will export semen from a foreign country arrive later eight months later will take information from the hospital that the woman has been impregnated and uh, the the child is a viable fetus which uh, the, the, the it is a viable fetus which will deliver which the mother will deliver and later they may claim through inter country adoptions and go through ways secure uh, orders from court all that could happen but we must be able to stop it if it is necessary because it ought not be are clear in our mind that this is not for commercial reasons what else can drive a person here to be offering um, the fetus for a person to be impregnated it's invariably the financial considerations that is what is the only reason and our women are such that they will be driven through their husband's decisions that not everyone is in a position persons who offer their homes for uh, renting they are not uh, fashionable uh, uh, women of uh, the city they are all poor women from villages who are drawn because they are the husbands a typical patriarchal society where they will force their women to if i re i require 5 lakhs i'll give you a lakh of rupees this man won't have given food even 100 rupees a day to cook food but he will demand food from the wife and then if she is going to be assured a lakh of rupees she will give uh, she will rent her home so that is what would happen and this act if this comes through an enactment it will stop and the cultural sensibilities are what we are talking about uh, see um, previously at a time when adoptions were all taking place within the family uh, of uh, there are two brothers one elder brother has uh, uh, son two sons three sons and then the younger brother doesn't have the child will be give, given an adoption to the younger brother they will know that the child will know who the natural father is who is the adoptive father is now assimilation to the families were always fluid because they were all living within the same compound same house same town there was something like that 
Now these days, change is getting adopted, whether they disclose, whether they need to disclose. These are very, very sensitive things. Uh, that's uh, um, a poor uh, conditioning here in India. So I know I have some relatives who have taken adoption and they have an enjoyable um, parentage. They, the children have wonderful lives. And the strange thing of what I came to know was when I was addressing a group of doctors from obstetrics, uh, there are 150 million uh, street children and there are 150 million couples who are sterile. Look at the kind of a balance in God's ways. So therefore that a child could be adopted, but then a child can't be immediately handed over to some person. It has to be conditioned. It has to be prepared. A child which is abandoned on the road could be abandoned for umpteen reasons. It may have come out, but if create a particular environment somewhere, uh, our mental conditioning for adoption um, in India is not good. While it, uh, it is uh, even uh, if, uh, uh, if some person like um, um, Brad Pitt's wife, I remember, but I, some Julie, I forget her name, uh, she had adopted the children from Korea, from Africa, from all that. It can't happen in India. Uh, we are very exceedingly sensitive. It doesn't, we are worried about caste. Again, why men rape also brings out the illustrations about how caste plays a role. Uh, how in every village it, uh, it gets to be a problem that all kinds of children are not uh, taken in adoption. The, how their parentage must be there is again examined. These are uh, in, in any country, while in the West, uh, the World War took away several persons, uh, several young persons of productive age, they died in the war. And uh, the society gave an extraordinary response by making adoptions possible. India has not given any worthy examples of good adoptions taking place. If they happen within families, they work. Otherwise, it's far and only progressive minded take. Otherwise, they take another wife if she doesn't always believe that woman is responsible. The man is always very is what they believe. So our cultural responses are bad and uh, we must move to, to a situation where adoptions are the norms. The next question is on uh, who should decide whether the parents or doctors on withholding treatment or proceeding with treatment for uh, disabled neonates or young children. Uh, tricky because uh, I've known in Chandigarh um, a pediatric surgeon telling me um, that many ch uh, children, see, you must know the incidence is fairly high. It's about 1% of children are uh, born with uh, ambiguous genitalia. Uh, whether uh, a child is a male or a female, they don't know. And uh, there is a, a judgment bearing an Indian name, Mani, uh, from USA, where uh, at a very young age, the mother decides that person will be a, um, will be a male. So it was a child born with uh, ambiguous uh, genitalia. And uh, as the person uh, was growing, uh, no, I, I think it's a case where uh, it was born, uh, the, the sexual, uh, uh, the sex that was assigned to the uh, person was, uh, you know, uh, was a female. Uh, but, uh, and at the time of uh, adolescence, uh, the child felt uh, very different. Uh, she was adopting practices which are normally not to a woman. Pardon me if I say so. That, that was a person who felt comfortable passing urine standing. This was uh, seen to be surprising. And uh, later it found, and the person sued the parents and the doctor. And uh, they said uh, uh, assignment, of, uh, reassignment of sex was improper. It shouldn't have been done. My doctor friend Chandigal says that the parents invariably say, sir, make, make the person a male child. Mostly their preference is for male when the child has ambiguous. And that's a very serious thing that can't happen. Uh, so therefore the consent actually can the parent as the guardian is the parent which will be there and a proper medical advice must be given, uh, driven through what is correct, what is appropriate. Sexual reconstruction to take place during a childhood uh, will be wrong. If a person is born with some defective genitalia, um, it gets to be done. The parent uh, is at all times responsible. If the doctor would resent 
or will not do that. These are again decided cases which are available, uh, which says the doctor protests, or direct, the doctor is not prepared to do, then they've sought the court's interventions. So it will be possible in a situation, normal situation is that it is the parent who, who decides and then the doctor affirms. It's not the doctor who can decide, it is the guardian who can decide. But again, the guardian decision um, is uh, suspect if it is going to be uh, sexual reconstruction. Uh, any other thing or any deformity of what you're talking about um, could be, again, situations. Uh, these are, now there are uh, hospice, uh, which uh, hospital care, which take care of children with disabilities. Uh, Down syndrome, do, do, do the parents immediately, because in the Termination of Pregnancy Act, any defective gene is also a good enough reason for you to terminate pregnancy. Uh, there is a strong uh, movement uh, against this kind of interventions for uh, people say that it shouldn't be done. Roe v. Wade, uh, a decision from USA is still much talked about. Uh, Republican view is now with a kind of uh, Supreme Court composition with uh, six conservatives, with young Barrett going there to Supreme Court, probably Roe v. Wade will even be changed. They will think there is no right, no autonomy for a woman to decide to abort, is what they will say. Because Christ has delivered the child, why would it be taken? So these are tough decisions. Um, so I, I wrote in a, uh, an article in the Hindu paper, and uh, where I said the tricky question of abortion of what I wrote there. Uh, a German example of counseling before you um, administer abortion, uh, whether a person has autonomy to decide, whether a woman who is bearing the child will have an autonomy to decide to terminate, uh, was the question. And I said uh, the uh, abortion period must be reduced uh, from 20 weeks. It should, from 20 weeks, they must raise it to 24 weeks, or in other situations, even to larger things, uh, longer months. Uh, when uh, the courts were grappling with the difficulties, I wrote an article and I was severely criticized that counseling is wrong. A woman has a right to decide. The women's organization took up in arms. Hindu paper allowed uh, responses in the letters to editor column literally for one whole week and then brought a separate box item criticizing my article. So therefore, these are tough decisions of who will take decision. The parent will, who will, the parent will take a decision as a guardian, they will be. Will that be final? It will not be. Court as a patch of parents will decide. Can the doctor decide? Can't, doctor can't decide. So this is my response. Uh, last question is from uh, Charada Darshini, who's a fourth year uh, BCom LLB student. Despite the mandate under the Transplantation of the Human Organs Act, that only altruistic donations can be made. There are there is a there are wide there are wide uh, organ uh, donation rackets that take place, uh, especially involving poor illiterate people. Uh, in, in these circumstances, what are the remedies available, especially when they're cheated by middlemen and uh, there is loss of organs? Uh, of the states in India, um, Tamil Nadu records the highest incidence of transplantation. The good part of it is that much of this, much of it is uh, uh, driven through altruistic uh, exercises. I know of um, a recent uh, situation of uh, a relative, a distant relative of mine, where uh, that person was dying. They offered. Uh, the organs to be harvested the moment I knew. And again, a very prominent person, I'm not too sure whether I can reveal the name, somewhere close to my office and a person, a business person, when he fell down and had an injury in the brain, and when they declared that there was a brain dead, the family donated all organs. It, you don't say a donation of one organ, it's a harvest of organs. You literally harvest everything. There is a person waiting uh, for spleen, for uh, uh, liver, for uh, everything. Every organ can be implanted, it can be transplanted. So in India, in Tamil Nadu has a wonderful history uh, of uh, transplantation being very high. All that is happening through mm -hmm. altruistic means. So therefore, there's not an exploitation, but exploitation takes place in a very large way. Now, it's in some way restricted. It used to be a big racket. I don't believe there is such a racket because now, a lot of families uh, are prepared to donate. 
uh, when a brain death uh, incident takes place, uh, donation is becoming uh, fairly. Um, I know of a judge from Punjab uh, who, when he died, his son is presently a judge. He was formerly a judge with a man who died. So his organs were also um, harvested and the body was handed over to the hospital for research. So therefore, there are um, interventions like this. There are good things happening like this. But um, wherever we had a problem, we, the transplantation, when uh, there can't be commercial consideration, uh, our courts always, you, you imagine this case, there is a judgment of Justice Dhanapal, where you will find uh, a Punjabi um, coming to uh, Tamil Nadu, giving a donation of uh, his kidney to a person. And the authorization committee examined and saw he had uh, no connection whatever. And the declaration that he was, uh, he was working with that person in one month time, he grew to such loyalty for his master, he decided to donate his kidney. Can anyone buy this story? This is how the story was presented before the authorization committee. A Punjabi arriving in Chennai, working as a cook in the family and decided to donate the kidney to the master. And an application was filed, authorization committee uh, rejected it. When it went to high court, bringing a challenge to authorization committee's decision. The Supreme Court, the High Court interviewed and said, here is a man who is dying. There is a person who is prepared to donate. Let it be donated. One more month, probably that man will not survive without a donation. Now here, every matching has been done. It seems to be working. Therefore, I be set aside the order of the authorization committee and direct donation. So these kind of judicial interventions are the reason why we allow for these kind of practices to take place. If we are very strict, it can't be done. Um, then it won't happen. Now, I don't think that kind of racketing of what you're suspecting, Sharda, takes place. Good for us that uh, better things are happening. People from uh, so many countries also, from Pakistan also, they, they have had uh, wonderful transplants done, lung transplants have done. All that can happen only if there is a brain death and uh, a willingness of the family to donate. So therefore, that is happening in large numbers. That is the only hope. And uh, there is... Uh, so long as we keep it, there must be a reasonable uh, US, UK has gone slightly differently. They said while altruism is necessary, um, but uh, commercial element will be taken care by the doctors declare, the hospital declaring uh, how much money can be collected, depending on the um, ability of this person, uh, the needs of the other, all that must also, could also be considerations of what UK has said. So it matter requires a debate to what extent we'll allow for this because India is poor. Uh, India is again, uh, not a free country in terms of decision-making for women. So these are all unfortunate things I'm trying to be, uh, Sharda, for you, uh, be honest to you, uh, that if you say that uh, UK law can be imported, it will cause a disaster. The same uh, reservation that I will have about uh, surrogacy, I will have about uh, transplantation and some compensation to be given to a donor. There are always problems, very serious problems. And, but how it can be properly regulated, any regulation when it is attempted, if it is the party, if the authority uh, relaxes it, the court will interfere. If uh, the, the authority is very strict, court will again make all alternative things. We have methods of beating all sensible interventions. So that's a much my, that is my worry. Uh, thank you, sir, for that very candid uh, interactive session. And I'm sure that we are, uh, all of our viewers enjoyed it. And this is a subject which has as much relevance to law as to life itself in general. And the, the shifting jurisprudence in this area, the way in which the law has grown and the way it is evolving is something which uh, all of us need to study and pay attention to. And we're looking forward to your writings and probably a newer edition of your book on law and medicine. Again, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to you for your time and uh, effort in uh, communicating these topics and discussions, relevant debates on this to all our viewers who have enjoyed this two-part lecture by, by yourself. Thank you once again and uh, to our viewers for being a patient audience. We'll meet once again for another session of Just As They Teach. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amrit. Thanks, the, thanks to also the university who is hosting this program for me. I'm looking forward to future interactions as well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir.